My father gave me a different last name, and we are both feminists and Muslim. Now, I understand that to many of you, these two words side by side are incomprehensible, incompatible, and certainly mutually exclusive. A feminist Muslim is supposed to be an oxymoron, right? Because in the media, feminists and Muslims are portrayed as this or that. But the truth is, these two words, ideas, ways of life even, can overlap. And what you hear and see are often misconceptions and cultural fabrications. Now, the journey of being a Muslim and becoming a feminist was not an easy one. Like many young girls, I have been constantly inculcated with societal norms about how I should dress, act, and talk. In both the secular and religious atmospheres, I felt like a pawn in an awful game of chess dictated by men. Although I attended a Muslim school that preached equality, we girls always sat behind the boys during prayer. And during my religion classes, I was bombarded with the stories of only male prophets. I was told by family that women may not enter the mosque while on their periods because they're unpure or even dirty, and God forbid they enter a sacred place in that condition. They must wear all white after their husbands die for the rest of their lives. Um, women must not pursue careers in order to avoid hell. Um, they can't be leaders under Islamic law. The list goes on. But I always wondered if these claims were true because at school, surprisingly enough, every now and then, I would hear stories of formidable Muslim women who defied all of society. Like, ooh, sorry about that. <laughs> skipped a few slides, uh, like Um Umara. She negotiated treaties and fought alongside the Prophet. She was extolled for her unparalleled courage, and Prophet Muhammad would often tell his followers that wherever he turned, he could see Um Umara defending him on the battlefield. Khadija, the wife of Prophet Muhammad, was a prominent merchant in a time where only men were merchants, really. And she was the breadwinner of her family. And lastly, the Virgin Mary, who many Muslim scholars consider a prophet, showed the world that God speaks to both men and women. <laughs> also, um, and, ooh, historical records show, excuse me, historical records show that Prophet Muhammad would often consult women. Um, oh, excuse me, I'm gonna backtrack a bit. So basically, wow, <laughs> would you ever think that such women would arise from a seemingly patriarchal religion? The fact of the matter is I looked up to these women, Umumara, Khadija, Virgin Mary, and I used them to dispute any claim that forced me to become a second-class citizen. But as I got older and increased my exposure to the media and its sometimes inaccurate portrayal of Islam, I could not deny that the status of Muslim women in Muslim communities is inferior. So, like any millennial, I hit the millennial, millennial, <laughs> millennial, okay. <laughs> I think I'm saying it right now. So like any millennial, I hit the internet and the Quran, of course, to better understand the inspiring and influential faith I'd grown up with. And I quickly realized that Islam, the Quran, Prophet Muhammad were feminists in a sense that they valued um, women and believed in their equality. Unlike any of the Abrahamic books, the Quran actually addresses both men and women as seen through this verse. Also, um, the Quran increases the status of women compared to earlier Arab cultures. Firstly, it does not blame Eve. 
uh, for um, original, or solely for original sin. In Islam, Adam and Eve made the decision together. Islam also further increases a woman's autonomy by giving her marital rights, property rights, divorce rights, equal opportunity rights, education rights. I mean, these rights can go on. And historical records also show that Prophet Muhammad would consult women on decisions regarding his people. In Medina, where the Muslims lived and the Prophet reigned over, um, women were often community leaders, teachers, learners, and appointed political officials. And these facts were really great. I mean, I was surprised, and I'm certainly sure you are too. But the fact of the matter is, they didn't answer my one prevailing question, which was, where did the claims and the norms that subjugated women come about? And I soon realized the answer was culture. So whenever I'd ask my grandmother, Grandma, where did you hear that women cannot enter mosques while menstruating, or they should isolate themselves after their husband's death? Her answer was always, my grandma, <laughs> or it had been known for generations, don't question it. Funny enough, what I would ask her, Can, why, why will I go to hell for not wearing the hijab, or, why can Muslim women be leaders under Islamic law? She would look at me in horror and say, uh, where did you hear that from? Yet when I would ask the same question to Middle Eastern women, their answers would be, my grandmother would have been known for generations. I quickly began to realize that Muslim women all around the world were fed different lies based on what their culture and their society considered important. In Bangladesh, where my grandmother is from, the hijab was never truly seen as a staple for religious life. Therefore, she never held the notion that one would go to hell for not wearing it. Whereas in Saudi Arabia, where the burqa is an obligatory attire and a commonplace, it's more natural for them to consider it an integral part of Islam. Now that being said, I come from a Bangladeshi family. I can't speak for the cultures of Southeast Asians, Hispanics, Middle Eastern, or African Muslims. But what I can say with certainty is that the lines between culture and religion have blurred greatly. So I'm sure you're all wondering, where does feminism fit into this picture? Well, after deciphering culture from religion, I have become emboldened to assert my rights as a Muslim woman, be it sitting in the front row parallel to men, because nothing in my religion forces me to sit in the back, or simply taking on leadership roles that are traditionally regarded as masculine. I believe in women's rights, equality, and freedom, and I certainly believe that Muslim women should take up, a, take up this baton and defy the cultural norms that are so, excuse me, so ingrained in both the East and the West. I believe that Muslims should stop depending on their culture for religious guidance, and it's time for people to start realizing that Islam is a lot less oppressive than what meets the eye. Now, before I leave you today, I'd like to tell you a story about a moment in my life. It happened just after I was born when my father made a very important decision, one that literally shaped who I am today and figuratively defines who I am now. And basically, my father gave me a different last name than his. Um, he wanted to ensure that I'd carry my own identity, not that of the patriarchs before me. He hoped that giving me a different last name would allow me to pave my own future unbound to conventions or expectations. Now, as a youngster, I would cry over this. I mean, not only did my peers question my legitimacy, but airport security was complete trauma. <laughs> like, it was. But in the midst of tears, anger, despair, complaints, my father would often tell me, you are now free. Use your freedom to do something good. So I suppose that my name became a self-fulfilling prophecy because I guess here I am today. <laughs> my father did really have an impact on me and 
If one man can challenge cultural norms, well, so can his daughter. <laughs>